Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. Now, in these shows, we focused a lot on hot button issues in Europe, such as help for Ukraine, EU competitiveness and migration. But today we're going to explore a somewhat less well known aspect of the European Union's work, its support for the developing world. The EU and its member states are the global leader when it comes to official development assistance, with an estimated 92.8 billion euros being provided last year. That commitment to the Global South was underlined at the June summit for a new international financing pact in Paris, which my guest attended. She is the EU's Commissioner for International Partnerships, Jutta Urpilainen. Welcome to the programme, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Let's start with some news. I believe that you uh, would like to make an announcement about uh, the EU's aid to Niger on uh, France 24, which hasn't been ma made public yet. So what is that? Indeed, actually, I'm very delighted to be able to announce that uh, we will give additional 66 million euros financial support to Niger mm -hmm. in order to uh, support uh, their educational system. We know that Niger is an important partner for the European Union in Sahel, in the region which is, uh, I would say, very young in terms of uh, population. So half of the citizens in Sahel are below 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So they are children and teenagers. That's why it's, it's so important that we are able to provide access to education to all those young people and children, including women and girls. Mm -hmm. And with this 66 million euros, we are supporting the government of Niger and of course the president, Bazoum, uh, in his uh, important work uh, to, to reform the education system and provide access to, to so, education. So how are you going to measure the impact? Because you do have this new tool or relatively new tool called the inequality marker. Are you going to use that to see how this particular aid uh, perhaps ends up reducing some of the inequalities in the education system, for, for instance? Indeed, we, we want definitely uh, to decrease inequalities also in, in education. Uh, this new inequality marker is really to measure and evaluate the impact of our uh, activities on the crown. So uh, can we really decrease inequalities through our activities? Uh, and I'm very proud that now we have a clear tool mm -hmm. uh, to be then implemented and, and, and used in our, in our uh, of course, in our partner countries, but also in general in our activities, also here in Brussels. You, you mentioned the president of Niger, so obviously you're going to be working with the authorities in Niger. Uh, there is in many of the countries that the EU is working with a very identified corruption problem. Transparency International has highlighted this, not in not just in Niger, but Zambia, where there's this global gateway program happening as well. Uh, so how do you safeguard the, the money that goes there and protecting EU taxpayers' money as well? Well, of course, we demand accountability because uh, we only use our taxpayers' money through the EU budget. This is how the EU collects its funding uh, from our taxpayers, from our citizens. And that's why, in terms of legit legitimacy, it's so important to really ensure that we receive and we reach results through our funding and through those projects, and the money is used in an accountable way. For, for instance, in terms of uh, Z uh, Zambia, I was in Zambia, uh, recently yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course there we are working very closely with the president uh, but also with the government uh, in order to fight uh, corruption in their yeah. governance, governance system. So we have very concrete objectives and also uh, targets and, just, and we follow yeah. and monitor how those objectives and mm -hmm. targets are also met and if they are not Mm -hmm. then we can redirect or even stop our funding to that country. So you do actually have uh, figures of how much money might have gone missing or been misused? Definitely. Yeah. And then, of course, there will 
uh, also be, you know, uh, some some kind of um, I would say sanction if yeah. we see that our money is 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 used in different purposes that it was planned to be used. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms <laughs> of uh, EU member states uh, hitting or not hitting their targets on uh, achieving their uh, development aid gold so the last figures that we have for this it's actually from almost a year ago but only four eu states were actually reaching their target which was 0.7 percent of their gross national income that they were supposed to spend on uh, official development aid only four out of 27 member states so how are you going to get more of them to to reach that figure i think that we have to understand that development cooperation and international partnerships are part of the geopolitics. So we are living in the middle of the geopolitical competition. And what we can see in our partner countries, including in Africa, but also elsewhere, that it's not only about battle of narratives, it's also very much battle of offers. So what different geopolitical actors can offer to our partners in our partner countries. Uh, and that's why I think it's, it's so important that e despite the fact that Ukraine has been our prior priority and it will be our priority in terms of uh, humanitarian assistance mm -hmm. and, and macro finance and assistance and military equipment, so huge support. Uh, we cannot turn our back to the rest of the rest of the world because that would be a huge mm. geopolitical mistake. And I was very delighted to see the preliminary figures from the last year uh, in terms of uh, official development assistance. Mm. So that really there has been uh, increase from 70 billion euros, around 70 billion euros to 90 billion euros. Okay. So our member states have been increasing their funding to, to de developing cooperation. But what is important, like you said, to have also a roadmap towards yeah. this 0 0.7 uh, objective and target, yeah. which yeah. of course is, is important, uh, I would say, and, and uh, it, is, it is a goal we are committed to. Let's go back to the uh, Paris summit, the, which we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, th there were a lot of issues there, obviously. Climate finance was one. Uh, also, the post Cotonou agreement with African, Caribbean and Pacific states. That's something that uh, President von der Leyen wanted you to focus on a lot, actually, wasn't it, when you first came into the job? Do you feel that with these repeated uh, blockages, let's say, by Hungary first, now Poland, is that agreement now basically dead? Definitely not. <laughs> it's not dead. We are very committed to that. Um, and I, of course, uh, I hope that uh, Council is able to uh, give approval to that mm. agreement as soon as possible so that we can sign it, because we concluded the negotiations on the post Cotonou Agreement over two years ago. Mm. So, of course, it is a question of credibility of the yeah. European Union, so we have to be able to move forward, and I hope that we could uh, be, uh, be in a position to do that still before the summit with Latin America, Caribbean countries in the mid of, uh, mid of July. So you think the dispute with Poland can still be resolved somehow? Uh, I hope so, because if I have understood correctly, um, you know, their request has nothing to do with the content of the agreement. But if you allow me to say only a few words on the Paris uh, summit, first of all, of course, I want to thank uh, yeah. President Macron and the Prime Minister Motley for convening that uh, summit, because I think it was important to bring uh, political leaders together from the Global South, but also from the Europe, from our allies, in order to discuss that how we can support our Global South partners in their green transition, which means that they need more climate financing in, in their uh, society. I was going to come on to that. So at the moment, uh, an, about 35% of your overall funds are spent on climate funding, right, for poorer countries. I, is that about is is that a uh, you think a a, a, real, a good target for now, or does it need to change given the scale of the crisis in Africa and in some Asian countries? Well, Team Europe, so the European institutions, together with our twenty-seven member states, we are the biggest uh, climate uh, finance donor uh, in in the world. So we have been doing our part, but of course we have to encourage other 
global players to do their part. Mm -hmm. And then we also need to reform those uh, multilateral development banks so that they can also provide more access to low-income countries, but also middle-income countries uh, in terms of climate finance. So we need to have a clear uh, a reform in our global financial architecture. And also from that perspective, the summit in Paris was important. Mm. Just a quick question on the conditionality of development aid. As you know, the European Parliament voted to actually include conditionality in uh, overseas, uh, in official um, development aid. So in other words, if a country is not cooperating with the EU, for example, uh, accepting asylum seekers that have been rejected uh, for their asylum claim at the EU border, then they might perhaps lose uh, some of their development aid. Is that the right approach? I don't personally think that that is the right approach. I think in order to make an impact and really influence to our partners, uh, for instance in Africa, also in terms of uh, migration, we need to have a comprehensive agenda. We need to have a comprehensive uh, offer. Uh, of course, migration is important uh, topic for us, for the Europeans. And I think that actually one argument why this new post Cotonou agreement should be signed is precisely this uh, migration. Because the post Cotonou agreement includes also a legal, uh, legal basis uh, for the readmission uh, uh, in migration. So it would give us a, a legal base through which we can then return also mm. those migrants which are leg illegally in, in, in Europe. So, uh, of course, we need to cooperate with our partners, but uh, I don't think that conditionality in our developing cooperation is the right way to receive uh, and reach results. We'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for being my guest, Commissioner Jutta Urpilainen, in charge of international partnerships here at the European Commission. I'll be back for part two of Talking Europe in just a few moments, so don't go away.